You're about to hear a message from one of our experiences right here at Hope Church on Sunday morning. But before you watch, before you do that, hold up. Click the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with all the videos we're going to be dropping every single week. We hope you enjoy this message. When you need to make key decisions in your life, you need to gain wisdom. When you are heading to a new place, new level in your life, you need to enter into the boardroom. The boardroom is essential. It is so necessary. And in the boardroom, we have to focus in a way where we can make wise choices and wise decisions. God wants you to make good, healthy decisions. But we need help sometimes. We can't just make decisions all by ourselves. Sometimes those are just snap decisions. But when we're talking about long-term, purpose-filled decisions, we need to have some things in our life called wisdom and people who can speak into and contribute to the decisions that are going to be necessary for our growth and for the fulfillment of our purpose. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 20, it says, walk with the wise and become wise. That means who I walk with, I become like. It's so important who you decide who's going to sit at your table because that is the truth. You get to decide who sits at this boardroom table with you. The Bible says also in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, that we should not be misled. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. What is the company? Who are the company that you are keeping? Who is the company that you are keeping at your table? It could be affecting you. Do not be misled. That means I could be being affected in a negative way in my life and not be aware of it simply because of who's at my table. You get to make that decision. You're going to see in the boardroom that, yes, you have to make the final decision, but you get to invite people into this space. Not everybody gets invited into the boardroom. And you need to remember that because there's a principle I want you to remember that we're going to get into that when I come into the boardroom, I get to invite people. That means I'm giving people access into a place of life in my life that I want to grow in, that I don't need everybody's opinion on. I just need a few key voices. Because I've learned, too, people who sit at my table affect the atmosphere of my life. So I want you to remember this truth. Yes, we give everybody love but we do not give everybody access. I know that just messed with some of you because you're saying, Pastor George, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to love everybody. I'm supposed to treat everybody the same. Yes, absolutely. But you're going to see through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ, he gave everybody love, but he did not give everybody the same access. And that's going to be our truth and principle moving forward. And that's what I want you to remember when you come into the boardroom of your life, that yes, you're going to give everybody love. As Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're called to love everybody. But when it comes to our decisions, when it comes to where we're going and the direction of our life, we do not give everybody the same access. Today, we are in the boardroom. Well, let's get to it if we're ready. Are you ready to go into the boardroom? Look at the person next to you and tell them, pull your seat up. It's time to focus, it's time to go to work. We give everybody love, we do not give everybody access. And it's so easy to try to combat that, argue about that because we're Christians. Well, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you're supposed to love everybody and we can take that to mean that everybody just gets all of me in every space and in every atmosphere. Let me read you something in John chapter two verse 23. I'm going to read it in the New King James, and I want to read it in the Amplified Version also. Watch this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem, he meaning Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Watch the key verse. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because what? He knew all men. 
and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Let me read in the Amplified Version. But when Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identified themselves with his party after seeing his signs, his wonders, his miracles, which he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, did not trust himself to them because he knew all men, and he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. He needed no evidence from anyone about men, for he himself knew what was in human nature. He could read men's hearts. He could read men's hearts. Another translation would say he knew how fickle people were. The purpose of the boardroom is to help you navigate relationships and thus navigate your life in a healthy way. Because we see in John chapter 2 that although people were benefiting from Jesus' gift, it did not mean that they would all honor his gift the same way. Because I've learned that people can benefit from your gift, and people should benefit from the gift God has put in you, and people should be blessed by the gift that God has put in you, but I've also learned that people can benefit from something they don't choose to honor. People should benefit from who we are and what we have on the inside of us, but just because people benefit, it does not automatically qualify them to gain access into every part of our life. Now, let me give a word of caution going forward in this message because you're going to be tempted to, to go out there and, 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 and live life paranoid of people. It's going to be real easy to do that. You're going to be, some of you are already paranoid of people. You got, you got trust issues. Anybody got trust issues? Come on. Thank you for the honest ones. But we shouldn't live life paranoid. That's not what I'm saying. Neither should we treat people like pawns. That's not, that's not what the whole purpose of the boardroom is. It's not to cut people down and treat them like just little uh, factors that can contribute to what we want to do. That's, that's not what this is. The boardroom, though, is the place where we should get wisdom and learn how to navigate relationships and in our lives with wisdom and pay attention to who we are giving access to. I want you to think about that as we move forward because who you are giving access to affects a few things. Watch this. Who you give access to into your life can and will affect your attention, your attitude, and your action. Who you give access to in your life will affect your attention. Say attention. That's my focus. That's what I, how I focus. It's what I focus on. The, those who I give access to will affect my attention and it'll affect whether I'm, I'm uh, focused on my purpose or I'm distracted from it. It'll affect my attention. It'll affect my attitude. Say attitude. attitude. Walk with the wise and become wise. That's what the proverb says, correct? And so if we walk with the wise, we become wise. That is to say, we could also walk with the unwise and become unwise because I become who I walk with. They told us this all through school. You become who you surround yourself with. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. How else can we say it? People are like elevators. They're either taking you up or taking you down. So you have to understand that the people you surround yourself with plays a role in the soil that contributes to your growth. So it affects my attention. It affects my attitude. Then it affects, it affects my action. It affects key decisions. It affects what you do. How many of you have ever been around people long enough that you started to inherit some of their traits? You started to become like it, and it affected your action. You started to kind of talk like them. You started picking up language you never used to use, whether it be good or bad. You started to, uh, your language started to be affected. Your filter of how you see life started to be affected. You started to see life through their filter. And their filter affected not only how you saw things, but it also, other people's filters can affect your faith. Case in point, Paul and Silas in a prison, their filter of being locked up in prison at midnight was to sing praise to God. And it's their filter of how they saw their situation that brought freedom to other people who were in the same atmosphere. 
So people can affect our faith, and they can affect how we believe, what we believe, how we see God, how we do not see God, all of it. And so some of us may have to do one of the hardest things in human history, and that is to unlearn some things. It is difficult to unlearn things that have been inherent in you for many years. Maybe traits that have been passed along that you were taught or maybe you caught that you just operate out of, but I'm here to tell you that you have a choice to decide who gets to sit at my boardroom table. Who gets to sit at my boardroom table? Jesus did not, what did it say? He did not commit himself to them because he was aware. He was discerning. He was alert to the fact that everybody don't carry the same motive. Everybody patting you on the back doesn't always carry the same motive for why they're patting you on the back. Some pat you on the back to celebrate you. Some pat you on the back so you might cough something up. I'm trying to find the real people real quick. So motive matters. Motivation is so key. And so Jesus understands this about people. And since he is the, the perfect picture of how to navigate relationships, he is showing us in John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, that just because I, I can do great things and just because other people benefit from what I do and who I am, it does not automatically obligate me to give all of who I am and open up and commit myself into a relationship. And so there's a few times Jesus displayed this, not only in John chapter 2. There was one time that he was going up on top of a mountain. He was going up on top of a mountain, and he has these 12 followers, right? He has these 12 disciples. And so he's going up on top of this mountain because he knows he's about to be transfigured into his full glory. And it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And so he heads up this mountain. But before he heads up this mountain, he tells nine of them, hey, y'all need to stay down here. Peter, James, John, I need y'all to come with me. And they don't know why they're going up this mountain just yet. But evidently, Jesus knew something about the temperament and the attitude and the spirit of those he was going to take up the mountain. That's why he did not allow all of the nine disciples to go up the mountain with him. Wouldn't you think if you're the son of God and you want more influence and you want their message to spread more quickly, you would show your full glory to all 12 of those who are following you? But no, he did that in a, in a private manner. He only allowed three of his closest people, his closest friends, his closest relationships to see the fullness of his glory. Meanwhile, the other nine are down at the mountain base. I don't know what conversations they were having, but if they're anything like church people, they were probably bitter. They were probably a little upset. They were probably talking about how, why Peter got to go and they didn't. They were probably upset that James and John got, got to go up there and got to do something they wanted to do. And why, they gotta, why has he got to take James and John? Why do they get to get the record? Why did they get to do that? I don't, you, did you hear Peter cussing last night? Why does he get to go up the mountain? Let me post about this. <laughs> Let me gain more followers off my bitterness. I know, I just stepped in something. I'll get to that, that later. Don't worry. <laughs> so they, they, they go up the mountain. They get to see all of Jesus. They see who Jesus is. That he, he transforms in front of them into his full glory and all white. He's just gleaming in a cloud, a glory cloud, hovers over the mountaintop, and they hear the audible voice of God saying, this is my son, do what he says. Only Peter, James, and John got to hear that because everybody can't handle your transformation. Everybody cannot handle your transformation. Those at the bottom of the mountain, the nine, saw him one way, but he only privileged three of them to see him in his fullness. Huh. And only three got to hear something the other nine didn't get to hear. And as they're coming back down the mountain, watch this. As they're coming back down the mountain, Brian, Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody what you saw here today. In other words, can I trust you? 
Can I trust you with something that I don't want known just yet? Because then it goes on to say that they, they understood after he was crucified, buried, and resurrected. So they had to hold this information until he completed his purpose. Who do you trust with information? Hmm. That's interesting. Moving on. There was another time that he was in a, 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 a pressurized situation at the end of his journey of his ministry. It was when he was in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. We know this word Gethsemane means place of pressing. So it was a place of pressure. And he goes into this garden and he takes Peter, James, and John. And he says, y'all stay here and pray while I go over here. He only takes them three. And he tells them something significant. He says, my soul is in such anguish unto death. In other words, I feel like, I literally feel like I'm dying. Hold up, you Jesus though. You ain't supposed to feel this way. You're the strong one. You're the one that everybody else can lean on. You telling me I can't even lean on anymore because you got issues too? So you can't tell everybody when you're sweating blood. When you're really battling in your private life, that is not privy to everybody. No, and, and, and mm, it is not privy. See, I, I, can't, I can't wait. I'm, 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 I got to hold it. I got to hold it. I got to get to that point in my notes. I can't get there just yet. We, it's not everything. Somebody just commented and tagged me in something yesterday. Everything don't belong on social media, and it was ironic. But everything don't belong there. Pastor, why are you talking about social media? Because that has now become a weapon. So we don't take everybody everywhere. But there's another time, that's the focal point I want to drive in on today. There's another time in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, he displays this same type of relational navigation. And he, it's in Luke chapter 8, verse 40, uh, it says, when Jesus returned, that the multitude welcomed him, for they were waiting on him. And so he gets off this boat, steps onto land, and there met him a, name, a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at the feet of Jesus and begged him to come to his house. Why? Because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. So this man comes to Jesus, and he says, I need you to come to my house. My daughter is dying. But the multitude was there just thronging about him. And then that's where we get the story where the woman with the issue of blood, you remember that story? She grabbed the hem of his garment and she was healed. And Jesus is there having a pep talk, talking to her about, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Meanwhile, Jairus is trying to like, Jesus, can we hurry this uh, motorcade up? So all right, fast forward, he gets to Jairus' house. Oh, before he gets to Jairus' house, they send messengers saying, don't bother him anymore. She's already dead. And Jesus tells Jairus, just have faith, only believe. Do you remember that? So it's in verse 50, when Jesus heard it, he answered them in Luke 8, saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. That's what he tells Jairus about. And so watch what happens. Watch what happens. Let me walk you through this, because we're going to walk through this. In verse 51, he gets to Jairus' house. In verse 51, it says, And when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go except Peter, James, John, and the mother and father. We can't forget that. So he comes to the house. Everybody's... Like, oh man, this girl's dead. I can't wait to see what Jesus does. Can't wait to see what he says in this moment. And Jesus turns around and says, look guys, I'm about to go in here. And I need y'all nine to hang out here. But I, do, I need Peter. <laughs> I need James. I need John. I need you to come in here with me too. The rest of y'all stay out here. And they close the door. Now, some of y'all's feelings would have been hurt. You would have said, I don't know if I need to be hanging out with this brother. He don't even take me no. He don't, well, he don't, he don't do nothing. He don't let me go in and see nothing. I don't know why I'm following him. Why am I friends with him? Why am I even? 
and they couldn't understand why they didn't get to go in. But watch this. It says, when he came into the house. I like that part, that it says, when he came into the house. Because when he came into the house, the house got something. When he came into the house, it shows us the power of the right people entering your life. Because when Jesus entered, it was mandatory that everything that didn't belong had to exit. And this is the power of the right people walking into your life. When the right people walk in, all the wrong stuff that don't belong has got to walk out. I just want to know, is anybody had some people that are right into your life and you've seen God have some things exit out of your life, some things that, that you didn't need that was hanging around, some situations that were frustrating that didn't need to continue. But when the right people entered into your life, into your home, into your situation, those wrong things that didn't belong had to exit. It's mandatory. When the right people enter, the wrong stuff has to exit. And Jesus is the picture of the right as right can get. Entering into a home. When the right people enter, watch this, you get wisdom you didn't have before. When the right people enter, you get peace you've never experienced. This is amazing that when, when, when people exit your life and you have peace, did you really lose anything? And I'm not villainizing people. I'm not trying to tell us to go and say, you cut off, you done, bye. <laughs> I'm just telling you to pay attention. Are you more confused when they show up? See, if we're not aware, if we're not paying attention to these things, we could be allowing things into our house that cause more confusion and keep us even more stuck and the right people are standing outside because the wrong things won't move. <laughs> you get resources you never had access to before when the right people come into your life. But he permitted no one to go in. Nobody could go except Peter, James, and John and the father and mother. That's critical because watch this. Remember John 2, Jesus knew all men. He knew all men. And he knew the hearts of men. He was aware of who he was surrounded by. He was aware uh, of people. He knew that everybody deserved love, but everybody does not deserve access. And he, can you imagine? Just, I just want you to think real quick. All the other nine disciples, they've already had to deal with not going up the mountain. So now I don't get to go in this room with you? How come I can't go in this room? I want to go into this room. I just want to be a fly on the wall. I don't need flies on the wall. I don't like flies. You ever thought about that? Why do we want flies? I, I don't want flies on the wall. And then I want to ask the question, and I'm just going to be really real with you today, because a lot of times people want to know information about stuff. My question is, why do you want to know so bad? What are you going to do with that information? What will you do with this information once if I tell you? What is your plan for it? Do you just need to know because it, makes, it satisfies some hunger to know stuff? Why do you need to know? Because there's some things that, that if my, I, I, can, I, I hear about, but I don't, I don't need to know everything about it. That's not my role. I don't need to, if I need to know about it, I'll, need, I'll know about it. We need to realize that, that sometimes it's, it's not our place to pry. If you need to be in the room, you'll be in the room. And Jesus is telling all nine disciples, those who are Christ followers, he's telling nine Christians, y'all can't come in here. You missed it. He's telling nine Christians, y'all ain't coming in here with me. Because he understood the power of boundaries. He's telling nine Christ followers that they're not going with him into this particular situation. That you're not coming 
in to this particular season with me. You're not going to walk with me through this. Why? Because Jesus knew all men. What does he know? What does he know? He knows that in the crowd of the nine, there's some particular people. He knows that there's a man named Thomas in the crowd. He knows that Thomas has some issues that won't particularly help out in this room. He knows Thomas because, watch this, after Jesus is crucified, buried and resurrected, Jesus shows himself to all his disciples, but Thomas ain't there to see it. And Thomas hears about it and says, unless I see the holes in his hand and the nail and the holes in his feet and the hole in his side, that's when I'll believe. So Jesus makes another trip. He shows up when Thomas is, is there and says, Thomas, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That Thomas, the same one, is in the crowd. And where Jesus is going, he needs a high level of belief. There needs to be a little girl that needs to be raised up from the dead. And he don't need to have somebody who's full of doubt going into an atmosphere that requires belief. Because Thomases only believe it when they see it. They only have faith after the fact. You know, we have after the fact faith sometimes. That after God does it, that's when we believe he can do it. But God is calling us to have faith before it happens. He wants to know, can you see it with your faith eyes? Can you believe that it can still be raised up, that it still has resurrection power, that there's still more to be done in your life? He's not waiting for you to see it and then believe. He says, blessed are those who believe before they see it. And when you need a miracle and when you need a dream to be accomplished, you can't take Thomas into that atmosphere because you'll mess around and allow Thomas to talk you out of your dream. Ask your neighbor, are you a Thomas? <laughs> Thomas was in that crowd. You can't take doubt into a place where you need big belief. Where do you need big belief at? And then plan accordingly who needs to be in that room. There's another person in the crowd of this nine, of nine Christians. Not only is Thomas, there's a guy named Nathaniel. Nathaniel's in this crowd. And the problem with Nathaniel is, back in John chapter 1, Verse 46, one of his friends, his brother actually came up and said, hey, we found the Messiah. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel responded, he said, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then they take him to Jesus, and Jesus says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And then Nathaniel's like, oh, you, you the dude. You're him. I'm going to follow you. And Jesus said, I saw you, Nathaniel, while you were under the fig tree. I saw you. And, he's not, and saying I saw you like I saw you under the fig tree is like saying in Georgia, I saw you under a peach tree. They were all over the place. If you'll hear it by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, watch the revelation, I saw you while you were under the fig tree. When Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves with fig leaves. And so by the Holy Spirit, hear this. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, I saw you while you were still in sin. I saw you when you didn't have it all together. So you got to be careful with Nathaniel's because Nathaniel's can't see past your past. Nathaniel's can't see past your past. Nathaniel's will qualify you based off where you've come from instead of where you're going. Nathaniel's have a hard time of getting over where you're from. They have a hard time getting over the fact that you've been delivered of drug addiction. They have a hard time seeing that you can still lead and still serve in a church and still deal with your own mess. They have a hard time, they have a hard time processing that because they can never see past your past. 
And they're more concerned about where you're from than they are about where you're going. Nathaniel's in that group. Nathaniel would have talked talk the girl into staying dead. And she was, she was good. She was, you know, had a conversation. Like, you don't need Nathaniel's when you're trying to go somewhere bigger than where you currently are. I'm not saying to discard them. I'm just saying that's not who you invite to the boardroom table. <laughs> and then, of course, the obvious one, Judas is in that crowd. Judas is in this crowd. Judas says, will act one way with you while secretly hiding their true motives and their true nature. Because Judas went ahead and met with, with the, the religious people and, and made a deal. He struck a deal to betray Jesus. And then the Bible says he waited for an opportune time. That means he took off his mask to go talk to them and he put it back on when he went and had communion with Jesus. But Jesus knew all men. And he knew those jokers are in the nine. I don't need those types of people with that type of thinking, with that way of living, coming into an atmosphere where I need a miracle. And people will try to make you feel bad for boundaries. One of the hardest things you'll do is putting boundaries between somebody who's already had too much access. Because now, when you're putting boundaries there, they treat you like you're the villain. And try to make you feel bad for protecting your relational health. And trying to guard your heart. There's, you know, there's some people ain't good for your soul. They are not good for your spirit to be around. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't look at their profile. It just mess with y'all. I love how this whole side being holy, like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. It just met you. Just mm, I can't. Mm -mm. And and here's some advice: you don't have to pick up every time they call the phone. Why? And this is, see, here it is. We, we have some type of thing in us as human beings. More, some people have it more than others where we feel, we have this, we feel this, this, this uh, need to please everybody. And if we have a, we tell them no or we don't answer, we feel like we're being bad, evil people. There's some people you need to mark in your phone, do not pick up. Because every time you pick up, you get pulled into something you didn't ask to get pulled into. Because I've realized when people walk into your life, you don't just get them, you get the spirit they walk with. You get the drama they walk with. You get the issues they carry too. And somehow, their issue became my issue and I was just living my life. Some of you doing that, right? You're going through your contact. I'm going to do not answer. Because <laughs> some of those contacts pull you back into things you ask God to set you free from. You ain't got to answer it. You ain't got to pick up. You ain't got to respond to the text. It's, but, it's, but it's this. It's, it's, it's taught us, oh, my God, what is it? An alert just went off. Oh, so-and-so liked my picture. Oh, they commented. Emoji hands, great. It's positive. Oh, they left a negative comment. Hmm. Should I post it? I don't know. Let me see. Hmm, oh, I got a good one. I got one ready to fire back. And it creates this emotional 
roller coaster that's just not healthy. You don't have to give those people access into this place and this space. I'm not saying they're not, they're not good people or not needed. I'm just saying be aware of who you invite into what spaces and places of your life. Thomas, Nathaniel, Judas, these are just a few that were in his crowd. We can't even go into the rest of them. But watch this. Watch this. Don't miss this detail. He didn't just take Peter, James, and John. He took who else? The father and the mother into the room. This is interesting. This is critical because he allowed the ones who produced and birthed her to come in to the room. Hmm. Because when you have produced and birthed a dream, or you're in the process of producing and birthing a dream, you must have people at your boardroom table who will not be quick to count you out, but will be quick to call you up. Yeah. Not call you up just by the phone. I mean call you up out of discouragement, call you up out of anxiety, call you up out of those bad mental spaces and mental things that you find yourself swirling about on the inside of you. They call you out of your negative attitude. They call you out of the misuse of some resources in your life. They call you out because they don't want to see you stay down. The right people are quick to call you up and not quick to count you out. Pay attention to voices who are quick to say, oh, that's done. You ain't going to do that again. That's done. It's dead. It won't work. It's not going to happen. And they're quick to count you out. But I like being around people who are quick to call me up. Call me up. Hey, you're better than that. Yes, God still loves you even though you did that. He still loves you and I still love you. You are still accepted. Get up. Come up out of that dead situation come up out of that thing you thought you'd be stuck in there is space ahead there is a road that God has for you and I don't know how he's going to use it because I don't have all the answers but he has a path that evidently you had to walk through this space for I don't need people who are quick to count me out I need people who will actively and take initiative on calling me up I need people to call me up. I need people who will walk into my life and say, get up. And don't see you as dead. Because Jesus arrived at the house. And he shows up. And everybody's crying. Everybody's weeping. Everybody's going crazy. And Jesus shows up. And it says when he came into the house, he, he brought all those, those, those uh, five people with him. Peter, James, John, the mother, and the father. And in verse 52, it says, now all were weeping and mourning, but he said, do not weep. Dry your eyes up. It's about to get better. Wipe your tears. It's about to improve. Get yourself together because there's about to be a shift in this whole situation. Who am I talking to today that needs to hear that there's about to be a shift? In your situation, a change in the atmosphere of your life. Too many people walking around with defeat hanging over them, and there needs to be a shift of victory into your life, into your language. Stop talking how defeated you are. Stop talking about how ugly you are. Stop looking at yourself in the mirror and say you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too ugly, you're too this, you're too that, and start declaring that you are a child of God. You are beauty made in his image. Yeah, you might have some love handles. Go ahead and love them handles. You might have something that people try to make as a, a deficiency in your life. Celebrate that you're a little bit different. Different. You are made in the image of God. Stop talking defeat into your life and start speaking victory over your life. Faith comes by hearing. That means I have to speak. If nobody else is saying it over me, I have to say it. That means it's got to come out of my mouth. That means it's got to come from my heart. That means I got it down in me. If it's coming out of my heart, it's going to come out of my mouth. It's going to come out of my mouth. It's going to hit my ears, go back into my heart, come out of my mouth, go back into my ears, go into my heart. Come out. And so I just keep producing a victorious cycle because I believe what the Word of God said. And he says, don't weep. 
she's not dead. He says she's not dead. To be able to stand in front of a little girl, something that's, that's not thriving, something that's not alive, and say, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And as he says this, he's immediately met with ridicule. Immediately. Be ready. Be ready. Because the right people won't do this. The wrong people will immediately combat you on your faith talk. Because the wrong people know too much. They know too much to believe God can do something impossible. The right people look at an impossible thing and say, yeah, but he can still do it. I don't care how much time is left on the clock, he can still make it possible. As long as I could do it, God didn't need to show up. But when impossible showed up, that's when I needed him to show up. And now that I, this thing is out of my hands and I've done all I know to do, that means I'm going to just have to lean on him and believe that he's going to do something that I could not do in my own strength or with my own power. And he speaks to something people are saying is done, and he's saying it's not dead, it's just dormant. I wonder how many dormant dreams are sitting up in this room and watching online. You, you allowed the dream to go dormant and you allowed other people to say it was dead. And Jesus saw it another way. See, the people in the room that were first there, they couldn't see a way up until the right person stepped into the room and said, I see a way up and I know the answer. And so the wrong people couldn't see a way up. The right people always give you hope and will speak to the hope inside of you because we all have hope and the right people will speak to that hope and they'll water that hope and they'll nurture that hope until it's full grown into faith, until that faith then turns and blossoms into belief that anything is possible, that my God can do anything because he created the universe and he put the sun and the moon in their place. If he can do that, then surely nothing is impossible for him. The right people people see a way up. The wrong people want to help you stay down. You need people at your table who can help you see a way up. I love the next verse. It says they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. See, they knew too much. They knew too much to believe it could be any different. Knowing she was dead. The next verse, I kind of like, verse 54, but he put them all outside. See, in this day and age, we would have had, uh, uh, this post would have gone viral. Local pastor kicks people out of the room. Because we got a spirit of offense running through our country. And everybody's offended at everything. And if you're not offended, you're trying to find something to be offended about. Because that's the spirit of the age. Yeah. Find something to be offended about so I can fight for something. Okay. And then I get other people to back up my opinion. And now I create little armies so we can all cheer each other on and nobody can hear each other because we're all shouting. But when he came in the room, all that noise had to shut up. And he said, all right, I wish I could have saw this, like how he did it. Like, did he go to the door and like Uncle Phil him, you know, from Fresh Prince? <laughs> like, did he open the door and say, y'all can leave? I wonder if he explained <laughs> and some of y'all busy explaining why people need to exit. You're trying to explain and write, write a, a college thesis on why they need to exit. I wonder if he just opened the door. I wonder if he just said, hey, y'all can get out. And they just walked out themselves. I don't know. It's not the point. I just, I'm curious. I like to know how Jesus did things and what it looked like. But they all left. So when he entered, they had to exit. Because when the right people enter, 
It's mandatory. The wrong thing's got to exit. And so they all exit. They all leave. They all get out. Somebody say, get out. They all got out because Jesus knew something. I think, I think it's a principle and it's a truth because some things won't get up until some people get out. Some things won't get up until some people or some things get out. I know this is like, there's, some, there's people arguing me in your head right now. Pastor Jonah, they're just, they're, you know, they're good, 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 good people. They're nice. They're, they do all this. Yeah. And you're not understanding that, yes, they may good, be good people. They may be nice people. But they may be the prohibiting factor. But we have got to have, it takes boldness, it takes courage to do those and make those types of decisions. And Jesus got them all out. And then the next thing he did, he took the little girl by the hand. You weren't supposed to do that. You weren't supposed to touch a dead body in those days. Like it, it was like very, you know, just you didn't do that. But he, he would have had to explain what he was doing through the whole process if all the other people were staying in the room with him. He didn't need people asking, why are you doing that? Why are you touching? Oh, you know you ain't supposed to be touching me. And you know, you, you ain't supposed to do that, Jesus. That's not, we don't need to be doing that right now. But that's why he came, is to touch the untouchable. To touch the untouchable. And so he's doing something that people would have tried to debate him out of and he touches her, and, and he touches the untouchable. And here it is, watch this. When the right people come into the room, they help you believe that nothing is out of the reach of God. That nothing is out of the reach. I don't care if it's your marriage, money, your health. It doesn't matter. Nothing is out of the reach of God. Nothing is out of his extended hand. Nothing escapes his sight. He sees all, and nothing is outside his reach. Every resource you need was, is within his grasp. Every door that you need open is within his grasp. Every relationship that you're praying about is within his care and within his grasp. Nothing is without, is not far from his reach. And he touches her. And then watch this. He calls to her. Isn't that what it says? It says, he called. He took her by the hand. First he put them all outside. Then he took her by the hand. And then he called to her. Saying, little girl, arise. He called to something that other people said was done and dead. And she responded. That means in order to respond to the word, there has to be some residue of faith that grabs a hold of what is being said. And if the girl was dead physically, that meant she wasn't dead spiritually. And see, that's the problem. We look at what's happening on the outside of your life, and the enemy wants us to focus on all the external lack and the all external deficiencies and get you focused on the outside that way. But God sees something on the inside. He says, if I just got a mustard seed size faith, I can work with that. If it's just a little bit of faith, if there's just a little glimmer of hope left in them and they will attach it to my word, I can work that type of faith because he said if you got faith of a mustard seed you can say to that big old mountain with that small old faith that mountain you have to move because 
the mountains have to obey and respond to the faith that comes by attaching itself to the Word of God. So the girl might have been dead physically, but there was some faith down in her that was left over. And when Jesus said, little girl, arise, something on the inside of her attached to that word, arise, and her feet started to twitch. Blood started to flow and her heart started to pump and her eyelids started to flutter because a word that was attached to faith caused a dead thing to get back up. It caused something that was impossible to other people to get back up. Why? Because the right people were in the room. Stand to your feet. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Stand to your feet. He said, little girl, arise. Watch this. Watch this, don't miss this. Not only do you hear better when the right people are in the room, but you respond appropriately. What does he do? He kicks all the whiners out. Everybody weeping, making all this noise. Can you imagine he's in the room and says, little girl, arise, and everybody in the background, ah! The sound of doubt would have combated the sound of hope. And so he said, we about to get all y'all out of here. Because when I speak, I'm the only voice she needs to hear. And see, the right people help you refocus. They help you turn your ear from nonsense. They will come alongside you and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, you don't need to be listening to that. You need to put the phone down. Don't even comment. It's going to be what it's going to be. God will take care of you. He is your vindicator. Let them comment what they want to say. Let them talk about you. Let them say you ain't going to make it. Let them do whatever they're going to do. Turn your ear from that. Put your ear towards the voice. Put your ear back on the promise because the promise never stops speaking. The promise of God never stops speaking. And today the promise of God is still speaking over your life that you shall be successful, that you shall live and not die, that you shall be healthy and whole. But it takes you making some relational decisions saying, I need the right people in the room. I need the right people calling me. I need the right people texting me. And I'm going to make a decision today to put out what needs to be put out. If it's habits, if it's mindsets, if it's things I'm doing that are contributing to me being stuck, I'm going to put it out. And every person that attributes and contributes to me being stuck, I got to put some boundaries in that space. I got to put boundaries because I'm missing out on something thriving in my life because I don't want to sit about Little girl, arise. But you got to be listening to the right voices. You got to be listening to the right voices. Hear me. Turn it down a little bit. Hear me. In this day and age, we have to, and some of you are kind of like, okay, I'm not that like into it, but that it's consumed our world, it's where we're at in the world now, okay? Social media has made it possible for everyone to give you advice. Okay? Advice you don't even want or ask for. People you don't even know commenting on places and spaces of your life. Hey, it comes with the territory, I get it. But don't let your soul become so consumed by those things. You gotta listen to the right voices. Don't go to social media seeking advice. Social media is not your boardroom. It is not your boardroom. That is not where you go to solicit advice or opinions.
I just, I just see it so much. And we all battle it. We all face it at some level. And I got to have the source. I got to know the voices in my life. I have to seek out those voices who are going to call me up and not count me out. Because some of us, we have associates, but then some of us, we have attachments. And just because you work with them don't mean they get to know every nook and cranny of your life. And that's why this is healthy boundaries. You got to understand, I may work with you, and we may be associates in that, in that regard. Then I got people who can lead me into where I want to go. Those are those mentors. You, you're going to have to seek out those people because they're already off doing things. You have to pursue them. I'm just trying to help us understand today that the boardroom is so vital that I don't make decisions in a vacuum all by myself. I immediately seek out wise counsel. And that list is not really long. Okay? Because the more people you involve in a problem, the bigger the problem gets. Okay? And at some level, at some point, when you begin to go to so many people, at some point you have to decide, do I want right advice or do I just want people to tell me what I want to do already? Because I'll be honest with you, man. I've sat with people giving advice, spent hours with people. They go out the door and do the complete opposite. Like, what in the world did I just spend an hour of my life sitting with you for if you weren't going to come and apply what you heard? And yes, there are phases. It takes steps. It ain't going to all happen in a moment. At the end of the story, the little girl sits up Incredible. And it's Peter, James, and John getting to witness a dead girl come back to life. The mother and father can't believe it. They're sitting there like, oh my God, this is incredible. Because they produced what was being raised. They gave birth to it. Be careful who you share your dreams with. Please be careful who you share your dream to. Because I, I, I would, I'm not even saying this in a spiritual manner. I'm just saying this because in the, a room this size and people watching, this has had to have happened. You've shared, some of us have shared our dreams with people and they've talked us out of it. Whether it was stupid, that's too big, that's too much resource, you don't know the right people, you live in Warner Robins. If I hear that one more time. Jesus was from little, some little podunk town called Nazareth. And he's the most well-known name in the world. All of history. Don't tell me God can't do something big in a small place. He specializes in doing something big in small places. Watch this. I, I promise you I'm trying to finish. I'm going to pray for you, and i got something exciting I want to share with all the dads. She gets up. Watch this. The next thing that Jesus tells them to do, he commands them that she needs to be given something to eat. How many of y'all hungry? I'm hungry. I'll tell you what. Why would you? Isn't it enough? that she's alive? Isn't it enough that she's alive? I mean, you've done your job. Isn't it enough she's alive? Because Jesus doesn't just want to see her alive, he wants to see her well. He wants to see her well. He wants to see her fed. And the right people don't just want to see you alive. 
They want to see you well. They want to see you fed. They want to see you thriving. They want to celebrate the fact that you're not just living, you're actually feeding. You're actually healthy in your mind. They don't try to, they don't try to add to the stress. They don't try to add to the chaos. They try to be people of peace and try to be the shoulder that you can lean on. See, right people don't just want to see you alive. They want to see you well. Right people just don't want to see you married. They want to see you thriving in your marriage. They don't want to just see you having a job. Right people want to see you being promoted at your job and they will clap for you. Right people will tell you the truth in front of you and not put a knife in your back behind you. Right people want to see you thrive in every area of your life because they don't want to just see you alive. They want to see you well. And here it is. Jesus gives them one more kind of odd command, in my opinion. Put the last verse up. After he tells them to give her something to eat, after he says, feed her, the last verse of the story, put the verse up. He charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, Jesus, we about to get ready to open this door. And when we open the door to this room, this little girl's gonna walk out. And everybody that said she was dead is gonna see her alive. All right, what do you mean don't tell anybody? We're going to step outside and everybody's going to be amazed. They're going to know something happened. And if I could play Jesus for a moment, I don't want to do that all the time, but if I could just put some words in here, I would have said, right, I don't want you having to exert energy and giving time trying to explain how she got back up to people who had already counted her dead anyway. In other words, when we come out of this boardroom, when we come out of this boardroom, you won't have to explain anything because your fruit is going to do the talking for you. I hope that sets somebody free. He says, when you walk out of this room, you ain't gonna have to say nothing because somebody will know something happened and you can waste your time trying to explain how you got up or you can just let the fruit of your life do the talking for you. See, the right people don't need an explanation. They just celebrate the transformation. They just celebrate the fact that you've been transformed. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. I don't know how he made it happen, but he made it happen. Anybody excited that there's some fruit coming into your life? I ain't gotta explain nothing because you just gonna see the outward appearance of what's going on on the inside. I once was depressed. I once was an alcoholic. I once was bound up with pornography. I once was a liar. I once was a cheater. I once was a thief. I once was a cusser. But then something happened on the inside of a room called my heart. And the Holy Spirit came in like a mighty rushing river. And now, now the fruit can be seen. I don't try to just show the fruit. The fruit just comes out because of who I've been with. And it's because of who I've been with, you see the fruit of it. Anybody want to fall in love with Jesus again? That when you fall in love with Jesus again, people see the evidence. They see the kindness. They see the gentleness. They see the self-control. They see the patience. They see the forbearance. They see the love. They see the joy. They see all the fruit that he put into you. Come on, somebody. Why don't you pray right now say, God, let me see the right people. This is
is what I'm going to pray over you for. Okay, I'm going to speak this over everybody. Everybody watching, I'm going to speak this over everybody. It's Proverbs 17, 17. Here's who I'm praying over your life and into your life. A friend loves at all times. All times. Everybody say all time. I think the writer meant all time meant all time. Not when you was living right. That's when they loved. Not when you showed up at church. That's when they loved you. No, no, no. All times. But then he makes a leap and says, a brother. Wait a minute, we just went from friend to brother. A brother is born for a time of adversity. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. The adversity you are facing now won't always be the adversity you face. And there are people, according to Proverbs 17, 17, that were born to help carry you carry that weight. They were born to walk with you through it. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit guiding us in our decisions of who walks with us through it, we'll allow the wrong, it won't be a brother. It'll be an acquaintance. Acquaintances aren't born for a time of adversity. Acquaintances aren't born for times of struggle. Brothers are born for that. So you gotta know who your brothers are, who your sisters are, who you can lean on, and then you gotta know who your acquaintances are, who you just see. This is what I'm gonna pray over, it's Proverbs 17, 17. How many of you could use some relational shifting? And, and, and the means I say is, who's gonna be in your boardroom? You need to reevaluate who's in your boardroom. Would you lift your hands? I'm just gonna pray over everybody right here. Lord, we love you. You know every single heart of every single person listening. Lord, we don't want to live this life having to explain ourselves all the time to people who don't want to understand anyway. Oh, I feel that. Lord, set us free from the need to try to gain people's respect, to try to explain something they don't want to understand anyway. We're going to let you change their heart. Our job is not to change people's hearts. So Lord, relieve us of that responsibility now. And Lord, help us to see the people who need to be in our boardroom. I don't care what age, we need people at our boardroom table who can help us navigate with wisdom, with discernment, and step into success and through every door you have for us. And Lord, I pray. Ooh, I'm about to pray a dangerous prayer. Y'all ready? All right, keep your hands up if you're ready for it. I'm telling you. Here it is. Lord, reveal, expose, remove, and restore every relationship that either needs to be in my life or does not need to be in my life. And let me have discerning eyes like you, Jesus, to see who I need to commit myself to and who I do not need to commit myself to. Thank you, Lord, for wisdom, and we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody clap your hands. We appreciate you watching so much. As a matter of fact, why don't you just come join us live on a Sunday morning? We'd love to meet you in person. For more information about Hope Church, follow us on social media, go to our website, and there you can find out how to get involved at Hope Church, when our next baptisms will be, and how you can give and support this ministry financially. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.